hello everyone and welcome to ck med my name is clark and i'll be taking you through cranial nerve 3 oculomotor today so to start this off uh, one of the most important things you need to uh, figure out and remember is where each of these nerves passes through and so inside of the skull we have this kind of venous sinus it's known as the cavernous sinus and we have multiple things that pass through this cavernous sinus one is your internal carotid artery passes through this uh, cavernous sinus, but also uh, are some of our other nerves, such as our V1 branch of our trigeminal, our cranial nerve number six, abducens, our cranial nerve number three, obviously, is what we're discussing, and our cranial nerve number four. Those are all passing through this cavernous sinus. If you have an aneurysm of the internal carotid inside of this cavernous sinus, most likely is going to damage cranial nerve number six, your, which controls your lateral rectus muscle. But as far as ocular motor goes, so we're utilizing the, the resource uh, from the Library of Medicine uh, at Utah uh, University, uh, our medical school, and uh, we're going to be diving into their resource as far as cranial nerve function. And it's very, very, very helpful uh, in understanding not only what the nerves are, but where they pass through and how they get to where they need to go. I'm going to add in a little bit more as far as function because this resource doesn't describe that very well, um, but it does uh, very well uh, strengthen your understanding of where these things pass. So for cranial nerve number three, ocular motor, uh, first we need to figure out what the name of uh, the nucleus is for our parasympathetics. So we obviously have our ocular motor nucleus, which is motor. Uh, so it goes to control all the motor for this, but also we have our parasympathetics, which is signified by this green right here. Uh, and this is uh, our Edinger Westfall nucleus. So nu this is a nucleus important for synapse input or afferents uh, from the cranial or from cranial nerve number two for the pupillary light reflex. So then this parasympathetics can go to control constriction of the pupil, as you see in your pupillary light reflex. Uh, so this is known as your Edinger Westfall. So what happens is it travels along with ocular motor nerve through the cavernous sinus, and then uh, it picks up a little bit of sympathetics, which is our own orange fiber. So don't worry about that right now, because that ends up going to your superior tarsal to help partially uh, elevate your uh, eyelid. Uh, but ocular motor, the, the motor portion, uh, goes down and splits up into a superior division, which goes above the eye, to innervate the levator palpebrae superioris, which is the main lifter of the eyelid. So if you damage ocular motor, you're going to be damaging um, that uh, innervation for uh, your eyelid opening. So you're going to have complete ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S. -S. Uh, that is complete ptosis. And uh, this also goes to innervate your superior rectus. So you're going to have also difficulty lifting up your eye. So that's if you damage superior division. Now, inferior division is uh, important because not only is it carrying the motor down for the re remaining three muscles that the ocular motor controls, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique muscles, but also your parasympathetics follow along with the inferior division. As it follows along through here, uh, the parasympathetics pop off onto a ciliary ganglion. So ciliary just means eye, and you know, I'm sure you'll heard uh, in histology as you have your little ciliary fibers and uh, all your uh, ciliary muscles and stuff like this. So this is why this is called ciliary ganglion, because your parasympathetics come in. So these are preganglionic parasympathetics come and their, main, and their uh, cell bodies are located in the Edding, Edinger-Westfall nucleus. So they come down and they synapse on this postganglionic parasympathetic fiber, uh, which has its cell bodies in the ciliary ganglion. Now these travel via the short ciliary nerve. The long ciliary nerve is for sympathetics uh, to here, but the short ciliary nerve is for parasympathetics. So remember S and S do not go together here. Uh, short and sympathetics do not go together. Short and parasympathetics go together and long and sympathetics go together. So your short ciliary nerve is postganglionic nerve, uh, par parasympathetic nerve, that goes to innervate two things. 
One is uh, the ciliary muscle, which when they contract, it loosens the fibers holding onto your lens. When those fibers are now loose, the lens squishes down and becomes fatter. When this becomes fatter, it refracts light greater so that you can see closer. This is known as accommodation. So all it does is parasympathetics go to the ciliary muscle to contract it, allowing for accommodation. This is uh, the parasympathetics, which came along ocular motor or cranial nerve number three. Now, it also goes further up to your pupil. And as we know, our parasympathetics control, control constriction. So therefore, it goes to the pupillary constrictor and causes that to contract. So it causes constriction. So as far as the afferent limb goes for pupillary light reflex, where you shine a light in to the eye, Cranial nerve number two picks up this, which is this guy right here, goes through the uh, afferent fibers, go through the optic canal and back to the brainstem. Once it gets into the brainstem, it synapses on Edinger Westfall, which travels, comes down to synapse on ciliary ganglion, which comes to then synapse and innervate the pupillary constrictor muscles. So that's exactly how cranial nerve number three works. And that's all at uh, all that's important for cranial nerve number three.